A very interesting story um, came out yesterday, and this is uh, about this place in Mombasa. Where is uh, uh, this this uh, estate exactly? Owino Uhuru Slam. I'm not very sure myself. Mm. Not really. So the Owino Uhuru Slam story has been in the news for quite a while. And what ha what happens is that um, there was a factory that was set up here, and it, the story was done on KTN a number of years back, uh, done by John Alan Namu and uh, Jijapevu, on what is happening to the residents of this particular area. So a factory was set up. Um, this factory would go and collect all the old batteries, come here and smelt those batteries, and basically just recycle and get their raw, uh, the components mm -hmm. out of it, and see what other use those components can be put into. The problem here is that these are lead batteries. Mm. So there is seepage of the lead onto the ground. And then that goes into, of course, you know, the water, water, water. and everything. So the residents of this particular area started uh, getting a number of complications, health complications. They do not understand what was happening. They just knew that there's this uh, factory here. Uh, we know they smoke, they smell, they whatever, but nothing much that they can do about it until some several organizations came together and they started raising the issue on behalf and advocating on behalf of uh, the residents matter went to various uh, areas and tribunals the national environment management authority was asked did you conduct have you conducted an impact assessment on this particular issue um, they said yes they had they were told no you need to do it again the case went to court yesterday the court found that um, these people re deserve compensation. And they were awarded 1.3 billion shillings, the residents of this particular estate, or we know Ruslam. And then they were, the government was told you need to pay within three months. Chop, chop. <coughs> Let me ask the question. Mm. Someone was manufacturing, was using lead batteries as raw material in his factory. Mm. Okay. Where does he come in in this suit? Because it's the government that is being ordered to pay. Why the government? The government should have taken care of all these things. The government, where was the government? Why are the government agencies? By the time the government is licensing this particular organization, right? Yes. By the time the government is um, allowing these operations to happen, by the time, because we have all these agencies that are environment management agencies. Nema. Nema to others, the like. And, and, yeah. Yeah, and, uh, and uh, local authorities. Where are they? This issue is important because remember, there's the other issue of uh, just here in in, uh, in, in Siokimau, in where residents are also up in arms because of pollution from a certain factory. Mm. And the county government of Machakos ordered the closure of this factory until they meet certain criteria. I mean, mm. they had been ordered to do some things by NEMA again. And uh, residents say that they still haven't met those, those demands. Mm -hmm. So this is an issue that comes to the fore. What is it that happens when organizations such as NEMA and the others uh, drop the ball. Uh, well, maybe we should take this further mm. and look at the raw sewage that has been pilled onto the lake yep. and ask the question, who are these? Because that has even further, further reaching eco ecological consequences. True. Yes. True. I think also understanding the impact uh, that such things would have on the environment from the very beginning is very, very important here. And we've gotten to the point where individuals are affected. Um, here we have residents of, of, of Owino Uhuru in Mombasa then having gotten sick first. Because the scary thing is that had they not gotten sick to the extent that they did, they would not have brought this thing forward, mm. right? Yep. Same thing for these individuals in Siokimao. Had this one family not lost their son and then had another one who was so ill and then others who continue to have respiratory issues because of this, the likelihood of it having come to the fore then was very, very low. So then we have to start asking ourselves the question that in terms of consideration of the environment, what happens then with factories and companies who are spilling out, you know, um, this uh, these dangers to the environment on a regular basis yep. in the name of commercialization so that question needs to come out how much regard really is there for the environment raw sewage is something that has become so normal for many people that they don't even see that it is something wrong that if raw sewage for example is spilled onto the roads where children play 
where vehicles are passing, then you bring it back into your home, and then that same water then finds its way to somebody's farm and then is essentially irrigating vegetables that people then consume later. Do you see the chain? But the regard for such actually doesn't in ever come to light until yep. somebody gets sick or somebody dies. You know, and what we're saying, I think that we need to get to the point and get to the very beginning of this chain and say, look, there are certain things that there are certain standards from the very beginning that you must meet. There are certain things. It sounds crazy that you have to say it, but that you should not do. You shouldn't spill raw sewage out in the open. Mm. You know, su such such things shouldn't be. Kitengela, another example. Kitengela, a few months ago, residents raised forty million shillings for their own sewage plant. Think with disgust. What would, until now, what is still happening when it comes to sewage that needs to then be gotten rid of? Or when of. you have heavy rains. Exactly. Think to yourself what really happens. So think about regulation. Think about standards. Think about things like this. That's where the focus should be. Unfortunately, these individuals who got sick are a byproduct of the ignorance that has been applied to many of these things. Um, I think you are kind with your view. Mm. <laughs> You're very generous because if you have government agencies whose job is to ensure that such things don't happen, because take the discussion even further and ask, what about the exposure that people who work in such establishments have? Because mm. mm. if you read the story of this factory, see the lead acid business is actually a fairly, fairly prosperous business. Its value as of 2016 was something like 4.6 billion US dollars. Mm -hmm. Okay, mm -hmm. And this particular factory, whatever it had extracted was actually being shipped to India. Mm -hmm. okay. Now, working in the factory put you in a great deal of danger. Right. Because you're exposed. Now, if you're exposed, the likelihood of your children also being exposed if you, because what they offered at the time was something like 200 jobs. Mm -hmm. Okay. So imagine everyone who works here. So the question you ask is, what were these safety measures that were guaranteed when this factory was actually put in place? And this goes straight to NEMA. Yep. Mm. Remember, we had this case in Naivasha where uh, just about the, the most tragic thing you can ever hear of, the, lady, the woman who killed four of her children. Mm. And my view was, we've read, we've understood. There's a department that's supposed to be uh, handling this thing. Mm. Why are those people not being taken to court? Yep. I'm asking the question, why is NEMA not in court? It is. In this particular case? Yes. So the organization that took the case to court is the Center for Justice, Governance and Environmental Action. And we'll be speak, seeking to speak to the executive director, Phyllis Omido, shortly. They moved to court in 2016 on behalf of the residents and sued the Ministries of Environment. Good. Health, Good. the National Environment Management Authority, Super. the Export Processing Zones Authority, Excellent. and Penguin Paper and Book Company. Lovely. Now, Justice uh, Omolo yesterday found that uh, the state agencies and the private investor who run the factory are liable for poisoning the residents. And they're the ones to pay 1.3 billion shillings to these residents. They were seeking 1.6 billion. Mm. They were awarded 1.3 billion. And the state agencies are also now required to go and clean up any remnants of lead from that area. Good. Very good. No, that is lovely. This is it, right? Mm -hmm. This ah, is when you feel, ah. No, that is delightful just stuff. Just served. But nice. the thing I liked about it, Kabisa liked, mm. three months to pay. Yes. Mm. Nothing you like, oh, okay, we'll start to, looking money over uh, the uh, next uh, 10 uh, years. No, no, no. COVID no, 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 notwithstanding. No, no. Yes. Pay now. Mm. No, it, if the state does not remove any waste deposited within the settlement, they should pay 700 million shillings in default. <laughs> I like this job. And as now comes to, it was 1.3. Mm. So we go to 2 billion. Two. Mm. Because the truth of the matter is the 2 billion will not restore their lives. People have died. No, won't. People have died. Yeah. People have died. When they were going to court, they were actually listing and saying so and so died. And um, the causes of this are basically just directly linked you to know, the lead even poisoning. Even as they take NEMA to court, huh? mm. you know, they should take individuals to court as well and then join them in the course because they're people who are responsible individuals yes individuals mm. must be singled out and said so and so was in charge of this so and so was in charge of this and joined them there was a time what was were we having a discussion with and they said that this is what was, ought, ought to happen as well yes if you just take an organization in court the individual who sat there you know just who made those decisions on behalf uh, of the this. signature somewhere Right. Or was bribed. Or was bribed. Because we know what happens in these cases. Actually, Someone just comes and mm. tells you, watch a company, you will be giving you some X amount. Mm. Right? Somebody took a bribe. Somebody did not do their job. They looked the other way. And this is what happened. 
that person personal culpability you know nema is in every part of the country isn't it mm. yes so and and the people who are employed in nema are people who are environment experts yep you cannot say that they don't have the capacity and if they do then they shouldn't be there so when you have a situation like this i think until and unless individuals who are responsible for the decision making for these organizations mm. start being charged individually yep these things will not cease yep. they must know that when this thing comes to light and should the matter go to court you are culpable and you on the issue get, of public yeah. health comes in as well the person in charge of public health in there's the someone who's in charge in the area they know mm. i mean you can see you can see people complaining you can you you're supposed to actually, actually be going people around. Keep coming to hospital people all keep the time. coming to hospital with a certain kind of ailment or with certain symptoms you're duty bound to start asking questions the same way somebody appears in the hospital with a gunshot wound you're duty bound to then report to the security agency and say such and such has happened by the time one two three people are appearing with the same symptom you know that the cause of this is because you ask questions yep. to be able to determine the reason why they have come in with this with this illness what area do you live in what are you exposed to one two three you start to see a trend then you must take it further and start to ask questions so i do agree that person must be held culpable as well it must be it must be mm. and i said it's it's we've been ignoring some of these things for too long because it's been put on the back burner like oh, okay uh, environment's not so much of an issue it's an issue it's an I oh mm. it's issue. a major one and that's where you live mm. Remember when uh, the nation carried a series of stories mm. about On poison water sources, right? right? Mm. Oh, they did. And mm. what was it showing? It was showing the same kind of things. It was. Yeah. So Nema and the other agencies would come up and say, you know, we try, but we get. Your job is not to try. Your job is to solve. To this, yes, and to solve the problem. <laughs> yep. But you know, if you're going to have this discussion, mm. then let's go right up to the minister. Bus. We are looking at this story, which is a big win in the war against uh, pollution of the environment. State ordered to pay 1.3 billion shillings to Owino Uhuru lead poisoning victims. Residents moved to court in 2016, seeking 1.6 billion as compensation for the deaths of their loved ones. Justice Omolo found the state agencies and the private investor who ran the factory liable for poisoning the residents. The state is also to, to remove any waste deposited within the settlement or pay a further 700 million shillings in default. This is a good case. The Owino Uhuru slums in Changamwe, Mombasa County, the people were affected by lead poisoning which emanated from a factory within the area. Uh, in a ruling yesterday, Justice Anomolo also ordered state agencies responsible for the environment to clean up any remaining deposits. And uh, th this is a case that had been taken to court on behalf of the residents by the Center for Justice, Governance and Environmental Action. It had also been covered widely uh, in the uh, local and international media on what was happening in the state this you know the state of uh, uh the people in this particular estate what was happening to them why nema why the ministry of health why the ministry of environment why the factory itself the, the investors in this factory were not heeding to you know the cr cries of the residents when they were saying look there's something that's killing us here mm. we are getting affected by by what we are seeing and and it's really not uh working for us and what was happening they were getting no reprieve. I just, I shudder to think, um, even as we wait to get more details about this, I shudder to think then what would be the plight of many, many, because I can tell you now, without any avoidance of doubt, that there are very, very many other areas in this country where other residents are suffering from something just like this because of either, you know, waste being gotten rid of in their areas of residence, they're suffering from some medical ailments that they can't really explain. They may have been to hospital and there's not any kind of adequate treatment that has been given to them. And then it can be pointed back to the to, to the environment. And there's somebody then with some kind of financial muscle that uh, basically is throttling any voices or, or muffling any voices that would come up in dissent to ask that something be done about this. Mm. It, it shines a light on the possibility of so many other cases like this happening, but they've not been brought to the fore because they don't have muscle to be able to bring that out. And the environment whereby it should be providing a safe haven for so many people yep. actually turns out to be that the environment then is attacking you because of one individual's input or one company's input you, you know what makes it even more bizarre is that you we actually have a constitution that very adequately 
looks after the interest of the monenji. Right. Mm. But the application of it clearly doesn't. Or the selected application of it doesn't. And this is why the individuals who are charged with the duty of ensuring that these things are done, they must be held culpable. They, 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 they cannot go scot-free. Mm. You cannot talk about an agency. An agency is run by individuals. Mm. And those individuals must be brought to book. Each mm. and every one of them. To the person who is supposed to go out and deliver that information. And everyone, right up to the top. Mm. Right up to the minister. Because honestly speaking, you earn a salary to ensure that you perform these duties. And you don't. Mm. If you just didn't, then we'd say, okay. But at the detriment of the lives of the citizens you're supposed, whose lives you're supposed to look after. No. I know that if we were to call on uh, right now um, the CS Ministry uh, for Environment, which is uh, Tobiko. Uh, Mr. Tobiko, it would probably be said that, well, you know, these things began to happen when he was not in office, this, doesn't that, matter. the other thing. But it actually doesn't matter because these things, regardless, still fall under your docket. And there should be, at, le at the very least, there should be a bird's eye view of what is going on around the country. Because guess what? If, that's your docket. It's the, not particular the, pockets. If the enthusiasm that's being shown with the Gong Forest. Mm. To remove the residents. Who well, to set that certain things right. Because yeah. that's what is, the, the department. The, 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 uh, the bottom line of this story is to set things right. Exactly. Mm -hmm. Certain decisions were made which one shouldn't have been made. Mm -hmm. Let's set things right. If that same diligence was followed with this, ha. Ah. Or cases like these. Yes. Because you can't tell me that it hasn't um, gotten to their whiff that there are other cases oh, they know. like this. Of course they do. And people are, this is the thing that miffs you know, me. This, you know this is their docket. This is the thing that really miffs me. How can they not me. know? Is that people, it's not like, it's not like uh, people get sick and they have a sniffle for some time and then it, it's over. Die. You know, you in reality, you know, you actually can't build a hut without Nema say so. Right. So they give approvals. Mm. They, they set the standard. And they do. They set the standard. They give the approval, or they deny that you can't go ahead. So when these things are happening, is it that there there is a wall over their eyes, no. or that they no. choose to turn no. a, a, a blind but eye? Once again, or you're, you're being kind. Or that you know, the, the money too sweet, as we they talk about, as in put it simply. These are not people who were ignorant. These were people who probably got paid. Right. Father Dulan, who was in this studio a while back, yep. five years ago, really hopped on this matter. Mm. And he talked about it and talked about it and talked about it. Yep. I am happy that it was picked up. Yep. This particular lady who uh, took the case to court, uh, Phillips Omido, also was working in this particular area. So she had moved there, she was working there, and she started noticing that her own child was falling sick. Oh dear. And what was happening to uh, the neighborhood? The neighborhood children would get convulsions and they go to the local hospitals. And, you know, the medics there would try dealing with every, anything from malaria to everything else, dysentery and all. Mm. And the conditions are not improving until they go to a point where they tested positive for lead poisoning. And this is when now it emerged. This is what's happening. So where would lead be coming from? Mm. Ah, traced it back to factory. Issues about the factory were, were, were discussed. And this is when the, the case was taken to court by Phyllis Omido and the rest. Because they, were, they had tried all ways to discuss with this particular company. They weren't to listening. To discuss with the authorities that are concerned. They weren't listening. Nothing. Not getting any feedback. And then what happens? You actually have to take it to court. And it's commendable that a case has taken four years to conclude. No, it's delightful, actually. And, and to, to this particular case where it's very clear that somebody dropped the ball. And the judge is saying, all of you, from the person <laughs> who authorized, from the person who should have checked a public health, from the person who should also have kept checking, that is Nema, from the person who authorized these people to operate from uh, this particular facility, all of you, liable. But meanwhile, let the government pay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Everybody needs to pay. I mean, in the way you are right about this, you see, as you think about it, how many other Kenyans mm. suffer silently mm -hmm. from this because they're disadvantaged and the people who should speak on their... You know, now this brings to my mind, mm. what on earth do these members of parliament and MCAs do? The local, right? Mm. Well, you know, you're a representative, really. Of that area. Mm. Yes. You come to come and start shouting in Nairobi. That's not your job. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no. Do you know? Or in the headquarter of that particular county. Because yeah. such a matter could not have gone without getting to where it without the MCA 
knowing or hearing about yep. it. it. It's not possible. In those days, the councillor no. and the local authorities, they yes. must have known. Let's speak to Phyllis Amida, who's now joining us. She's the Executive Director of Justice, Governance and Environmental Action, Centre for Justice, Governance and Environmental Action. Good morning, Phyllis. Good morning. Thank you very much for speaking to us. We're going to just do an introduction and then take a look at traffic and then come and have a proper conversation on this. This is a landmark ruling that you got yesterday. Yes, it is. Um, it's a landmark ruling for the community, but also for Kenya. Mm -hmm. And uh, all of us are pushing for environmental justice in, within the country. The case has been in court since 2016. Just take us through briefly. Um, when, when did you decide to take this case to court? What is it that you had seen? All right. Um, we, we knew that we wanted to go to court early um, since, since uh, 2004 when we started, but unfortunately in the old uh, constitution there were no provisions that were as good as the ones that we have now in the new constitution for environmental justice in Kenya. And therefore, um, because of that, we, we uh, could not get justice uh, during the old constitution. Remember, we started this movement in 2008. We actually went to court in 2016, several years after, several years after we started fighting. So uh, for me, it's one of the good things that we have uh, from the new constitution, and that's why we have to defend the new constitution. That's a very good thing. Let's take a quick break and then uh, come and have a proper conversation into this. Tell us the plight of the people of uh, Owino Uhuru, um, what was happening to them, what are, what's the impact of this? What kind of conversations had you had with the investors there the, of this factory, with the local authorities, with the agencies responsible for environmental management, with the ministries, with government? We'd like to know the story, the whole background story of uh, this particular case as uh, how we got to this 1.3 billion shillings award. We are speaking with the executive director of the Center for Justice, Governance and Environmental Action, Phyllis Omido. She took the case to court with, with her organization on behalf of the residents of uh, Owino Uhuru slums in Changamwe. I have to say Ouru. Owino Uhuru slums <laughs> in Changamwe. Uh, Mombasa. Brother, you've and, been assimilated. Uh, Owino Uru. Mm. <laughs> they have won 1.3 billion shillings <laughs> out of this. Phyllis, uh, before we went to the, uh, to the break, we wanted you to come back and tell us um, the background to this story. All right. So, um, in 2009, we started uh, a movement uh, move that, uh, that, that was aimed at shutting down little refinery BZ. This is because I had gotten this job at, at the refinery and three months down the line, my son tested positive for lead poisoning. Mm -hmm. I uh, went into Unohuru uh, and tested three other children randomly and all the three children tested positive for lead poisoning. At that time, I was still um, very naive, I believe, because I trusted that government would act if I told them um, the story of my child and these other children. Mm. So I went to, I distributed letters to the EPZ authority, I went to the ministry, uh, the, uh, that then uh, public health. Um, I spoke to the doctors that were attached to the municipal council at that time, mm. and I gave them the results, my son's results. I went to NEMA as well, and uh, several other state agencies. And I, uh, at that time, what I was telling them is we needed this, um, Smelter moved from the location from Owinohuru. It was uh, a very tough thing and a wake-up call for me. And uh, I realized after pushing for almost a year that nothing was going to be done by government because mm. the smelter was protected by some very powerful individuals within Mombasa. Mm -hmm. um, in 2011, I started... Actually, 2010, I started organizing the community for demonstrations. And... Uh, any time demonstrated, what they would do is that they would close the factory for some time, maybe two, three days, and tell us, oh, we are working on compliance. And then shortly after, they would reopen the factory. In 2012, I decided to do a mega demo. No, in 2011, a mega demo that uh, blocked M Nairobi Mombasa Highway. I was arrested um, during that. Before even the demo began, I was arrested. Mm. And... Um, 
taken to Changamo police station. Uh, the next morning I was charged in court with inciting violence and people gathering. Yeah. Um, so I had to stand uh, trial for a whole year. And within this year, you know, I could not do anything. So the, the, the pollution became very, very worse. Mm worse than it was before. This is when we started seeing uh, people actually convulsing in the community and dying. Um, several women um, had miscarriages. We saw women losing their wounds uh, from, from um, miscarrying uh, several times. And so the situation became worse during the time, 2012, especially when we were in court, because we feared that any action would be viewed as contempt of court, and it would make things worse for us. Um, remember, the witnesses against us were mostly um, uh, state agents and, and state agencies and uh, police, and therefore, uh, chances of us being in, um, in prison were very high. So for the whole year, we were fighting get ourselves free in 2012, and during this year, things became really bad for the Unohun community. We uh, were acquitted in November in 2012, and uh, the same month, I organized another demo, a mega demo in Unohun, and we continued doing demonstrations, um, and it became cut and game with NEMA, uh, the Ministry of Public Health, and, and all the other ministries. Uh, for several years, they would shut down metal refinery for a bit, uh, then they would reopen again. In 2015, um, I, I, got, I won the Goldman Environmental Prize, and uh, at that time, we knew that we wanted to go, we didn't have the finance, we knew we wanted to go to court, we didn't have the fin finance to go to court, um, and we knew it was a very expensive affair. Um, so, after, immediately after the Goldman Prize, when I came back to Kenya, I set up a team of, uh, of lo uh, lawyers, and uh, we started going through our documents to ensure that we had as much evidence as we did. We realized we didn't have enough evidence, so I did a petition uh, to Senate, mm. to Parliament, um, asking both of them to do um, their own investigations into the case. Uh, the Senate Committee on Health was sent to Nauru, and a task force was set up, um, and they called it the Nauru Task Force, a task force of experts uh, across different state agencies. And they came to first to Center for Justice. I ran them through what we had, uh, what we had gathered so far. Yeah. Uh, at this time, we had tests that we had done on the soil, the air, on the vegetation, we had so many tests that we had already done, enough to prove that something was really wrong mm. in the community. Mm. Um, so the task force listened to us, and uh, we went together to the community, and they commissioned their own tests. Mm -hmm. The uh, SDS and Cambry also came on board, and they did a prevalence study that concretely quantified the contribution of the lead smelter the rod of environmental and health hazards that were happening in the community. Wow. So we wanted to create a, a link between the smelter and what was happening in the community. Mm. So this was uh, done by um, uh, done by Cambry, Cambry and SGS. Concretely quantified mm. the contribution of the smelter to the health and environmental hazards in Owinohuru. So um, after that, the Senate uh, released their report mm -hmm. after the task force handed in their report. Parliament also shortly after did their own study, tested, um, I believe Senate tested 50 people and Parliament also tested 100 people in the, in the community. So we had enough um, we now you had, had enough a war chest. Basically you, you were ready. You, yeah. had, you had enough material to take to court. Yes, we had enough material by end of uh, 2015 mm. and January uh, 2016, mm. I filed the case in court. Mm. Um, and so this started our journey uh, in court. Um, it has been a, a long uh, journey. It mm. has been a costly journey, but it's all been worth it mm. to see today when uh, justice has been served. I know to the Unuhu community, they are happy, but I know it might not feel like justice because it took too long 
too many people died. Too many people lost their how many, lives. How many people have died uh, from from your records? So far, we have lost thirty children, a little bit more than thirty children, mm -hmm. and um, uh, about twenty adults that we have documented so far. And this is within um, a period of how long? This is since the smells have started up to 2014, mm. realized that we were unable to shut down metal refinery yeah. from the beginning up to uh, 2014 when we shut down metal refinery. And metal refinery was not shut down because parliament took a stand for the people or because Senate took a stand for the people. No. Mm. When we realized that nothing was happening within our country, we were really we were unable to move because there were political powers that were supporting this melter. Mm -hmm. We went to the community through the east african community we passed a law a legislation that banned the export of lead and lead alloys from east africa right and then they put now to start impounding containers that left uh metal refinery who trace these containers their number plates and then would inform the the port mm. so they started impounding these containers and taking them to court so, so basically other action that actually basically just led to the closure of this particular uh, factory yes. so it was, became too expensive for them to operate and this is what led actually to the closure of metal refinery finally oh. in 2014. Can I ask um, you, um, moving, I mean, just take a few steps uh, before you went to court. I want to assume that there was some kind of communication then between yourselves, even as residents of this area, and the um, company that was involved in the smelting. What uh, was their response, their initial response? All right. Uh, they were very arrogant and arrogant. They talked to us the way all the other people who pollute Kenya speak. They said that they had the licenses. Yeah. Uh, they, they had completed with the laws in Kenya, mm. and therefore they don't understand what uh, we were making noise about. Mm. And remember, we have letters from NEMA writing to us, telling us that what we are we are telling them is hearsay and there's no pollution in you know, Oulu. No. They so Nema basically would write back to you and tell you that uh, the, yeah. w what you're claiming is not possible. It's not happening. Yeah, it's not possible and that they were ready to defend it in any court of law. Okay, at that time, Did I they know people died? Did they know that people were ill and that people were at risk of death? Were they aware of this? I documented, I documented and I ensured I circulated the information in all the government departments from the first person who died called Carissa mm. up to the last person who died in the community. I would document this and make sure that I shared it with all the state agencies involved. That is mm. Nema Public Health Institute Authority. I kept sending the letters. I kept it consistent. Yeah. And this, these letters are one, that has been, one of the things that has also helped us in court. Mm. Yeah. It's a it's a long journey. I mean, these are very many years. You know, we're just looking at it from 2016, and we are forgetting that it. Uh, 2008. It's, yeah. Those are those are eight years prior that you had been going the back and forth, even getting charged yourselves and uh, g going through the court process yourselves, when you are accused of inciting people to violence, just because some organizations that are supposed to be doing some work are not doing their work. And so when when. Parliament was conducting its uh, investigations, the, the National Assembly and the Senate, and they came up with their reports. What was the recommendation of their report? So they had several recommendations. Senate, uh, the Senate uh, especially had very good recommendations. The first one was that they, they would, the, the, the NEMA and other state agencies should clean up uh, a process called remediation. Mm -hmm. They should remediate, or, you know, who, this is the removal of lead elements from the soil, from the water, from the uh, general environment, from the houses of the people. So Senate asked them to do this. They asked them to test all the community members and provide um, medicine. Mm. Uh, asked, they asked the Ministry of Health to provide, provide medication for the community. But one thing also Senate did is they asked us to go to court because of Article 42, Article 69 and 70 of the Kenyan Constitution. Yep. They asked us the case to court in order to get compensation. They, they didn't have the power to order um, any form of comp compensation for the community, mm. but they directed the relevant state agencies to um, to clean up the, the, the soil, you know, the water environment, and also treat the, the people mm. of you know, who look. Parliament also um, came up with a very good report. They also agreed that there was lead. They had found very high levels of lead um, in the community. 
they also came up with their own uh, raft of recommendations. Mm. Uh, none of which was ever implemented at all mm. for the community. It's unfortunate. We are speaking with uh, Phyllis Omido. She is the executive director of the Center for Justice, Governance and Environmental Action. They took a case to court on behalf of the residents of Owino Uhuru Slam in Changamwe, Mombasa. The court has agreed with their case and awarded the people 1.3 billion shillings that should be paid by government agencies and the company that was uh, accused of uh, leading to this lead poisoning. This is a big win and that's what we're discussing. The Situation Room. In the room is Eric Latif, Nduoko, C.T. Muga and on the line is Phyllis Omido. She is the Executive Director of the Centre for Justice, Governance and Environmental Action. Took the case on behalf of the residents of Owino Uhuru Slam in Changamwe, Mombasa because of lead poisoning. 30 children died. 20 adults died and this is um, until 2014 the document they, um, the data that they had uh, until 2014 these are many people to die and the causes can be traced back directly to one particular factory mm. and government agencies were basically just sitting there doing nothing city what i had to ask you phyllis is what was the cost of this entire process <laughs> Uh, our our spreadsheets in the office are looking at them yesterday. It's more than 20 million that we have spent since we started, both on the studies, on uh, the litigation, um, putting together the legal team. You know, we, we, we wanted to get the best minds in Kenya. And uh, so we, we, we chose a law firm that was located actually in Kisumu because they are the, 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 to us when we met them and spoke to them, they seemed like they, they, they were grounded and they, 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 they had um, knowledge of environmental justice. Mm -hmm. So remember our lawyers, our legal team uh, was coming all the way from Kisumu every time that we were going to court. We had to mobilize the whole community every time to be in court. So it was a very costly affair. We had to document, we had... Uh, to get people in court, uh, media, and all those people documenting the case as, as it continued. Uh, because we believe, even for future generations, um, this, this case is, is really landmark for Kenya. What it's is it that influenced your determination? Pardon? What made you so determined? Um, when I started, I, I believe I was just very angry at the situation. I could not believe that such a situation would go unattended by all the state agencies in Kenya. But I, I continued the tone that I saw it having on the people of Winohuru, solidified my resolve that I would see this too. The day, until the day that I was arraigned in court, I, I denied the fact that I was an activist. I kept saying, no, mm -hmm. I just want people to act on this issue. I'm yeah, not really yeah. an activist. But the day I was charged in court, um, when I slept in the cells and in the morning I was walking out, the whole community had slept outside Sankama police station. And as, as I was being driven away in the police, the community started walking after me because they didn't even have fare yeah. to come to court. Mm. So that is the time that I, I stood in court and I knew that I had become an activist. And after that, I knew that I had resolved to the day that justice comes for the community. Mm -hmm. There are people in the community that are still living with the lead poisoning. Remember, WSO defines lead poisoning as two micrograms per deciliter of lead. You know, we know who are the people who have up to 420 micrograms per deciliter of lead in blood. Like, you cannot even know, it's more than 400 times yeah, that what is lead high. poisoning is supposed to be. We have... Uh, the lady who had the highest level, her thyroid has given in. She lives a miserable life day because of exposure to lead. Mm. So for me, the suffering that I saw the community going through, um, the mothers that lost their lives at child's birth, the children that were born who tested positive on yeah. day one, mm -hmm. tested positive for lead poisoning, this solidified my resolve to continue um, the fight. Um, Phyllis, it just appears, I mean, it's, it's evident that uh, there may be many, many more cases like this around the country, not necessarily with lead, lead poisoning, but could be that there are other things like this going on. And there could be another Phyllis somewhere who is thinking that, you know, I want to be able to do this, but I have these monsters um, that I'm facing. Could be the organization. I don't even know where to start. Um, obviously, there was a resilience that you had. Um, and 
where where do people um start from where where should they where does the strength even come from to begin with something like this because it may seem like yes and i'm not going to 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 be a dampener on what happened yesterday but just like you've said now there are people who even though this ruling was given in the manner in which it was they are going to continue suffering they are still sick um they will live with this for a very long time god forbid that anybody else dies as a result of this mm -hmm. But around the country, any other cases that are being seen like this, what would you say that people need to do to take the first step um, to begin to fight some of these things? Uh, I believe many activists are coming up, environmental activists. Actually, at Center for Justice, we have a mentorship program. We have brought together so many activists, uh, environmental activists from around the country. And we are mentoring them and sharing our experiences with them so that then they are able to replicate this across the country. Um, when we started this fight, actually, uh, NEMA went around the country and we counted a total of 17 smelters that, that NEMA shut down that were operating in Kenya. Um, in, by 2015 and therefore it's not, it's not something that is uh, unique to Uhuru. it's something that is alive and has been happening in our country um the first step is to start engaging the the state agency the hardest step is now getting the evidence of what you're talking about uh getting people to run the test remember um we partnered with so many people during this especially the media yeah um i, I remember one of the media houses tested 100 people for us. Mm -hmm. They sent their team to the community. They tested 100 people for us so that they get evidence that they would then use to air uh, their programs on TV. Mm -hmm. And therefore, the, 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 the greatest for us have been our partners, both within government. Remember, even within the state agencies, there are people who are sympathetic mm -hmm. to um, any cause that you bring up. There are people who are controls about the environment. So you need to identify those. I know it's frustrating sometimes when you go to these government offices and uh, they, like, you know, uh, they dismiss you very dismissively. Yeah. Um, seen it in the ruling in court, the judge has noted the manner in which they, they were very dismissive of this whole issue. Mm. Um, mm. So it's up to us activists and Kenyans in general to keep pushing our courses there's a lot of pollution going on around the country yeah. we believe that we, there's a lot of work still and the judge has handled that he has directed NEMA to come up with legislation also phyllis was the media okay. supportive of you in any way in your struggle oh media pl played the greatest role of all because one of the things that we needed was a win in the public opinion mm. when we were going to court before we went to court and all the media houses came together. We saw all the media houses coming together and running the story of a winner continuously. Yeah. We were in and out of so many media houses around the country. And uh, actually, the media were very brave. Were very, very brave. Even when the Senate committee came to the community, the media was there. They put them to task. Mm. They aired the whole story of the winner. So media has been one of our greatest partners. We would not have won this case without media support. Phyllis, there are very many wins here. There's the 1.3 billion shillings to the community. There's a community winning against a Goliath. And there are also an other wins for, for humanity. I mean, the kind of resilience that and dedication that you have put to this also ought to be com commended. And I think we just want to take this opportunity to speak to you, Phyllis Omido, directly and tell you, congratulations. This was very good. This is very well done. How is your child now? Uh, my child is well. Uh, he's free from lead poisoning. His uh, last test, um, he had less than five micrograms of lead in, in his blood. Right. So uh, he has managed to shed off lead. But you remember, uh, lead knocks off IQ points for a child. Mm. They struggle with their education. So this is something that both uh, my son and the children of Uluru will struggle with. Uh, for the rest of their lives, yeah. those that were very bright in class now are struggling because of the exposure to lead. But so far, almost almost all the children have managed to shed off the lead in their blood. We wish you all the best and we wish him and the other children all the best. Thank you very much for speaking Thank to you. us, Phyllis. Thank you for having us. Thanks, Phyllis. Thank you. Phyllis Omido is the Executive Director of the Center for Justice, Governance and Environment Action. Took the case to court, or sustained, even before court, took the case up to everybody who ought to have heard this case since 2008. Commendable.